Hello, I'm Tim Clark, and this is Conversations About the Vietnam War. Uh, my guest today is Joel Esty. Uh, he was a uh, part of the 196th Light Infantry uh, Division. Yes. And uh, Joel, uh, uh, help me out. I believe you were a graduate of Olympia High School. Correct, Olympia High School, 1966. Okay, and uh, what happens to you in terms of uh, uh, are you working? Uh, what's going on? Graduated from high school, I had enrolled in a um, um, vocational school, which was in Tacoma, and I finished that class after one year. And in 1967, I did not uh, re-enroll in the class, so I received my draft notice in 1967. Um, rather interestingly, my uh, my dad was in World War II, and I. I was, heard the stories that he had. He had the war souvenirs from World War II, and uh, as I was a young young boy growing up, I w wanted to emulate my dad, which basically, in my mind back then, was if dad was in the war and he survived, I wanted to be like my dad. And so when the draft, when I graduated from that, that school and the draft notice hit me, um, I was okay with then going off to, to the military, even though it was for two years, and I knew what I was going to be doing. So. So, uh, well, Joel, uh, you also, in a previous conversation, mentioned that there were some uh, uh, aspects of how people viewed World War II veterans and the job that they were doing, and uh, that that influenced your mindset. Do you re recall any of those uh, instances where you saw visually? Uh, yeah, back in the back in the early '60s, there was I always had a, a deep respect for soldiers that served in World War II. Of course, my dad was one of them, and he, I knew some other uh, neighbors that had served during during World War II as well. So there was a, a high sense of respect for what they did and for what I was able to learn either by reading or you know newsreels or things like that. And so it was um, that was part in part helped with my transition from what what I what I learned about World War II veterans to my desire to serve in the military and serve this country. And so that kind of got me going. That was my, uh, so much my springboard for getting into the, into the military. Okay, uh, all right, so uh, you uh, were drafted. Uh, you then set off for boot camp. Where was that? Uh, boot camp was at Fort Lewis. That was you know, eight, uh, about maybe 12 weeks in duration. Uh, everybody went through boot camp. It was basically the indoctrination or the transition from civilian life. Uh, no more long hair or longer hair. Uh, you didn't have a choice in clothing, and so you're basically indoctrinated into the military, and um, that's when the training actually began. Uh, did you learn about uh, weaponry at that period of time or uh, uh, any other types of, uh, for lack of a better term, warrior skills at boot camp? We did. Oftentimes the, the drill sergeants that were there uh, teaching us had come from Vietnam or come from previous wars, and so they would do what they could for us in the civilian environment to prepare us for wh where we were going. And so basic training basically was um, an indoctrination into warfare. We had hand-to-hand -hand combat. We had a lot of training on the rifle with using grenades, familiarity with uh, map reading, compass reading, navigation, uh, escape and evasion if we were having to be caught uh, in a combat zone, uh, skills like that that would keep us alive. And uh, the units that you're, that are training you are also looking for leadership, is that correct? Correct. During, during boot camp, it's a great time to where the, uh, the military would flesh out, so to speak, or at least they would be able to identify those, the natural leaders, those that could uh, bring men to them because of their leadership skills or whatever they recognize at that point in time that would make them uh, not so much a target for advanced leadership, but it was kind of a natural selection. Okay. Uh, you then found yourself off going for advanced training. What type and where? That was when the fun began. To advanced training took place down at Fort Polk, Louisiana, and this was training for uh, jungle warfare, however, at Fort Polk, Louisiana, that was in the dead of winter. So it was an in interesting uh, process to uh, go through infantry training uh, during uh, very cold periods of time, but then having to use those skills and realize that you're going to be using it in a um, uh, different environment altogether. So the, the different skills that they taught us was advanced uh, skill training in map reading, compass reading, navigation, 
uh, search and destroy uh, missions, observation posts, uh, basically a heightened level of training that would keep us alive and uh, while we were overseas in Vietnam. All right, so let's take an example of uh, compass reading and map reading. <coughs> Where does that translate into what's actually going to happen to you in the field? It was expected that everybody uh, had a base knowledge and understanding of how to use a map and a compass. And the reason why that was important, because if we were, as an example, operating at a, say, a squad size level, which would have meant anywhere from maybe six to 12 men, uh, which I was in charge of for a, per a long period of time, if we were out uh, on a mission and we were under heavy fire, being able to use the map and compass and identify my location on a map and then call back to a fire support base which had uh, artillery and mortar support on it, I would be able to direct that fire to a location around me, pretty much saving, uh, potentially saving us and taking out the enemy. Uh, are there, was there any other tactical training that you encountered in Fort Polk that became part of your daily life that you didn't realize when you were first taking it? Oh, let's see. Part of it was, uh, obviously, there's first aid, things like that, how to care for one another if we were um, wounded, injured, things like that. Um, I mentioned escape and evasion. There was a significant, a long course on that where they put us through uh, uh, some training as far as what would happen or what could happen to you if you were, if you were captured and what you should do immediately upon being captured to, uh, uh, to avoid that or at least to get away. All right, so uh, after you finish Fort Polk, you're now literally uh, going to be uh, in transit headed towards Vietnam. Uh, how did you uh, get there and where were you going? Actually, when we finished uh, the advanced training, I think we were sent home for a period of time to vacation, as you might imagine, and then we had to report to a demarcation point. I believe it was in uh, maybe Fort Lewis or something. McCord, where a large transport would take us from from that location to, uh, oh, I believe we went into uh, uh, Da Nang, or maybe no, it was D Da Nang, and then from there we were ferried by smaller transport to the smaller areas, like maybe to Da Nang or to Chulai, as an example. And then Chulai was a staging point to where we would be assigned to smaller companies and then transported by helicopter uh, to those companies, which are generally at a uh, fire support base. All right, so uh, let's uh, get a sense. So the larger base is Chulai, and uh, this is uh, just south of the DMZ, is that correct? Correct. And uh, from there, you're assigned specifically to a company. What company uh, do you remember you were assigned to? It was the, the AmeriCal. It was the large division, but the company was the 196th Light Infantry, and the company was called Charlie Company. So each, each um, division had different companies in it of different strengths. And so Charlie Company being the one that I was assigned to, there was uh, that, that company, four platoons, and each platoon had a number of uh, squads in it, generally four or five, made up of a smaller group of men, which is anywhere from maybe uh, six to 12. Now, uh, uh, evidently, uh, this was an area that had seen a great deal of activity long before you got there. Uh, Correct. And uh, so when you're assigned out of July, you're headed towards wherever Charlie Company is located at that point, and uh, you're inserted as a replacement. Is, is that accurate? Correct. So my training ended, I was sent to Vietnam, and along with a number of other uh, replacement troops, newbies as we were, or FNGs, I won't tell you what that means. But anyway, we were sent to replace those individuals, those men that had served their year in, in, in country. And so as we were ferried out to the fire support bases in smaller numbers, uh, we would get off the helicopter, and those men that had finished their one-year tour of duty would then get on and be transported back to the world, as we called it, civilization. All right. Uh, you had not been there very long, um, literally only about, uh, well, all right, let's, let's, let's take your um, uh, application of what you were trained for and now what you're doing. So uh, there's been a transition to an attitude of winning the hearts and minds of the locals. What does that actually mean? 
We had a taste of that when we were at the advanced training at Fort Polk, and basically that was the, the military's, the, the desire on the part of the United States that to help us understand that if we were in a, a strange area, which we were going to, we were expected to do uh, what was necessary to befriend, certainly not, not injure or, or maim the, the locals in any way, shape, or form. We wanted them to kind of embrace what the United States was doing, what the Army was doing uh, in, the, in the country for them. And, hopefully bring them to our side. All right, now obviously uh, your unit primarily does not speak Vietnamese. How do you communicate with these people? We had interpreters. Uh, they were converts. They could have been from the South Vietnamese Popular Forces. They could have been the South Vietnamese Army, but they were assigned to our units to be the bridge between those of us who didn't speak English and the locals. Uh, so we needed their skills to be able to uh, interrogate in some cases, to question uh, the locals to find out where the VC were going or the North Vietnamese Army. And in some cases, those that we, we are trying to befriend under the winning of the hearts and minds are actually VC or North Vietnamese sympathizers. And these interpreters had a way only they knew to be able to get at the, at the reality of what they were doing. And so that helped us out. And in terms of enemy activity, what kinds of physical evidence are you looking for when you come into a, an occupied town? Um, we, whenever we would approach uh, like a small uh, area, it's not unlike so the rural areas of, of King County as an example, but it would be uh, a hooch area to where um, there would be a number of um, small houses to where the farmers would, and their families would be living in those areas and they would then till the soil, uh, cultivate the crop rice, uh, the rice crops and then harvest the rice uh, when, at the end of the season. If, there were, uh, if they were uh, VC sympathizers, as an example, they might have stored large amounts of rice, more than they could have potentially used. So that was an indication to us that it was a supply point for the, for the enemy, which we would then deal with that. Um, sometimes we'd, we would always enter an area like that and be on the lookout for some type of, uh, uh, could have been a, um, um, a bomb of some kind, a an explosive device. Um, um, anyway, it was bo a booby trap was what I'm looking for. And so we would pay attention to different things. If the enemy, not the enemy, but if the, the locals that lived there were not going down the same trail that we were on, that was an indication there might be a reason for that. And so uh, that's kind of an indication as far as what we had to be aware of as individuals going into, into harm's way. All of the senses, the hearing, the sight, the smell, the gut reaction, the intuition came into play to help keep us alive, and that, that worked most of the time, sometimes not so good. Now, you also, uh, one of the changes in terms of tactics employed, could you differentiate for us the difference between a free fire zone and a no fire zone? Back in Vietnam, they had, um, as you mentioned, the free fire zone, which meant if there was enemy activity in, in a particular area, we were free to engage them, whether that was small arms fire, or whether that meant calling in artillery or mortars to eliminate the enemy. We did not need to call back for permission to do that. Rules of engagement had not evolved to the extent they are now to where uh, soldiers have to call in for approval to do that. That was not part of our mindset and part of our, um, what we had to be aware of. The, the no-fire zones, and we never really got a, um, a specific answer on that, but if an enemy contingency went into this magic area, <coughs> excuse me, we were supposedly not supposed to fire on them. Um, sometimes those lines are rather blurred, and realizing that if we didn't, if we knew there was uh, enemy combatants going into that area, if we did not take care of them, they could come back and then uh, take care of us at another point in time. So it was always a, a value judgment and we, uh, how, can I, how can I say it, we, uh, we didn't say we fired upon them, but we said they went a different direction. Okay. Uh, in your uh, helping me explore the idea of your area of operation, can you give me an example of how the fire base uh, system worked? So maybe a good example would be if Seattle was a similar to like a Da Nang or a Chu Lai, then areas like maybe Renton and Issaquah would be a smaller 
area, which we call a fire support base. So the large areas were the huge installations that had all kinds of materials and supplies that were needed that were then taken to the smaller areas, which would be the fire support bases that would support uh, the smaller contingencies of troops, like companies that were out in the field, like the unit that I was with. And so these were staging areas for not only uh, ammunition, water, and other medical needs that we need. They were also like small hospitals as well. And so they also had um, uh, mortar and artillery support that would support us in the field if we needed to bring in um, fire support to uh, help um, take care of an enemy. All right, and uh, Chulai, as we mentioned, is below the demilitarized zone. So unfortunately, you're in an area that's seen a great deal of activity even earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, uh, uh, can you explain to me uh, uh, how you uh, used your tactics in the field to uh, basically constantly be on the move looking for signs of that activity. Our mission being uh, called a light infantry unit was we were ideally mobile and able to move quickly uh, throughout, throughout a given area. And so there was advanced, advanced or additional intelligence that we were made aware of to where troop movements, whether they're Viet Cong or the North Vietnamese Army, were gathering or where they had been or speculating where they might go. And so we were sent out there to make contact with them and, and the, the philosophy was search and destroy. So you got them and, and destroy them before they could uh, take care of us. So we are constantly on the move uh, in doing so through either uh, search and destroy missions, observation posts, which help us gather intelligence or other, other forms of maneuvers. Now you also coordinated with other outfits, uh, LERPs for argument's sake, what would they do? We came in contact with, with LERPs, which uh, were called the Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol. And those are generally much smaller units of individuals, maybe five or six units uh, of men that would go out in a very small unit and their sole purpose was to infiltrate to where the enemy might be. If it was a, say, battalion of North Vietnamese, uh, their, um, their mission was to go out and find out how many were in that unit, what kind of weapons did they have, uh, what was their, uh, where were they moving to, and then they would gather that information and then report back and then get out alive because they were, their intent was not to make contact. They're too small of a unit. So they would give us the information that we needed to be able to then um, um, take action as far as where we were going to go as a company or maybe as a battalion. All right, so uh, 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 let's put you out on, on uh, a simple uh, search and destroy uh, 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 target acquisition mm -hmm. where uh, you haven't made contact, you know they're in the area, but you haven't made contact with them yet. So uh, you arrive during daytime, right. then what happens? Generally, the way we would be at a um, at a, a logger site, which is an encampment, if you want to call it that, and then during the day, uh, we would send out, or the company commander would send out patrols to each point of the compass, north, south, east, and west, and that was we were the search and destroy <coughs> components. And if we were going out into a particular area, uh, oftentimes we would draw sniper fire, uh, and if we were able to take care of that individual, we did so. If we weren't, if it turned out to be a larger unit, may have BC or North Vietnamese Army, we would then, or I would as an example, as a squad leader, call back to the fire support base and say we've encountered a force of um, undetermined size, but we think it's at least, um, you know, maybe 50 or 60 people uh, would like to call in artillery. And so that would start the process that we would use to, to bring in uh, the mortar fire or their artillery on the enemy. All right, on this particular day, you haven't made contact, so now we're heading into night. What changes in terms of how you operate? Well, kind of an interesting point. So you make, um, it became frustrating to us. We're all keyed up. This adrenaline rush is going through us. You want to make contact. That is your job. You, uh, you feel slighted if you're not able to use those skills, unfortunately, to say. So if that happened, which was, that happened quite frequently, we did not make contact, so we would come back to the unit and then we would, we might pick up and move to another location because the reason for that was the longer you stayed in one location, it made it easier for the enemy to pinpoint us and maybe bring a larger force that, that they would then throw at us during, during the evening. All right, uh, so you've been in country, <clears throat> you've taken fire, uh, you've now, through your experience, been elevated to uh, an E5. 
You're right. now a squad leader, and suddenly you find yourself uh, now uh, headed out for a place that we'll call uh, uh, Tainim. Uh, why were you called there? What was the mission, and what happened? This is in May of 1968, and I was still, I was only 20 years of age, and so our unit was called up to, uh, to support a Marine unit that was up at the demilitarized zone, or the DMZ as we called it, which was just on the south side of the demilitarized zone. They were not having a good time. The party was not going in their favor, and so we were called up to support them and help them out. And so it was, uh, we were being uh, shelled artillery and mortars from the North Vietnamese side. We were taking quite a bit of casualties um, each day when the, uh, the point squad was uh, identified as the one that would have to go into a, a hot area. Generally what would happen, there would be at least two or three uh, killed as well as some wounded, and so it was an extremely uh, hazardous period of time up there helping the, helping the Marine Corps. And so the mission was to support another military force that needed, needed the help. All right, so you're going to be relieve pressure by uh, bringing fire support into an area where you still haven't determined the size of the group that you're encountering. Is that an accurate portrayal? Yeah, very much so. We, uh, I, just, we just, I just remember that there was a large contingency of North Vietnamese Army that were over in that area. But for the most part, the, uh, what we saw was uh, intense sniper fire with uh, a lot of um, artillery coming our way. And we also used, and it was not used very often, uh, we had um, strafing runs or bomb runs from, uh, from the Navy that would come in and drop uh, napalm or strafe the area. So that was indicative of a very large troop movements that were identified over in the area. And so, uh, How do you mark a target in those types of conditions? I mean, you're in a jungle area. At the DMZ, it was pretty much open field. It was, it was all, pretty much all open, not much cover at all. And so the FOs, the forward observers, were the ones that had the eyes on the ground that could have knew exactly where we were, could pinpoint our location on a map, and then really a coordinates, in this case, to the, to the Navy, to the Navy fighters would then know exactly where we were, and then the FOs would then direct them to uh, maybe uh, drop napalm 300 meters to our, to our north or uh, at a grid coordinate further away from us. So uh, it was rather close. You could remember hearing, or not hearing, but feeling, you could hear everything, of course, but you could feel the heat from the napalm going off. And so uh, while it was hazardous having the, uh, the jets go over us, it brought relief because it uh, it, uh, it kind of ended the party for the North Vietnamese, but it saved our lives as well. Uh, did you have uh, support from helicopters on other smaller type missions? Yes, oftentimes the helicopters, each one of the Huey helicopters is armed with on uh, this port and starboard side with uh, machine guns, M60, 30 caliber machine guns. So they would provide a level of support as they were coming into a particular area or as they were, they were going out. Additionally, we had, uh, when necessary, access to larger gunships. It could be maybe C-130s that had uh, miniguns on either side, or they might have, I believe... What, what, what's a minigun? How does that change uh, what's going on on the ground? They're Gatling guns. And so if you have, uh, if you can focus on what a Gatling gun looks like, it's a seven-barreled or about seven-barreled machine gun that actually originated in Civil War was brought to life and refined and used in Vietnam. They're an awesome, awesome individual, not individual, but a weapon system. So they would be used as an example if we were in a uh, particular area and we were surrounded by, by enemy uh, forces, the uh, C-130 would maybe circle the area and then just spray the area with this Gatling gun fire, which was devastating. So oh, that's a huge amount of ammunition being expended in a short period of time. Anywhere from three to 5,000 rounds per minute. That's, that's a lot of lead. Yep. Uh, so uh, in a more peaceful setting, uh, what's, what's resupply by helicopter like? We had to receive ammunition, water, medical supplies. They would bring hot food to us and mail. It was a way to, to be somewhat civilized in a rather uncivilized environment. So about every four days, uh, helicopters would bring in all of these supplies to us. Beer and soda was very much appreciated. Mail from home was appreciated. The packages from home were even more appreciated because it was 
It was a relief from the sea rations that we had, the, uh, the food that we had to live on while we were out in the field. So, uh, And uh, uh, you had a variety of helicopters that you encountered. Uh, uh, what's a Chinook and what's it used for? The Chinook is basically a, a double-bladed with um, rotors at both in, at the front and the rear of the helicopter. That, those were large transport uh, helicopters that would take large troops or large numbers of troops to diff different areas. The smaller ones, which we call them Huey helicopters, which still fly frequently in this area, would take maybe up to eight or nine or ten um, troops to an area or remove the wounded or take the killed out of out of the out of the area, and they would also be those were the um, uh, the vehicles that brought the supplies to us because they were relatively small and could get into a tight area. Uh, and uh, communication on the ground between you and the fire base, you and the helicopters, uh, how was that accomplished? We used a device that was uh, the initials were the PRC uh, twenty five or the Prick twenty five as we refer to it. It was about the size of a large ammunition can. It probably weighed about fifteen or twenty pounds. It had a range of maybe um, I would say maybe fifteen miles, maybe twenty miles. So we would use that to stay in contact with other other units in the area, or we would also use that same device to call back to the fire support bases if we needed additional, uh, like artillery or a mortar support. How often are you attempting to uh, recheck the lines of communication when you're out in the field? We would do that frequently just so that we knew that we were in contact with each other and it was basically just a radio check. Uh, it was just a simple format that we did before we would go out on a mission to make sure the radio was working and the battery was charged. So your squad maybe <coughs> had a particular name that they used so they, uh, they would know who was checking in because they've got a lot of people in the field. Yes, so each company, each company commander would send out units from his respective company and each one of the platoons had a particular name. Each one of the squads uh, had a name as well. But if we went out on platoon strength size, there was generally a lieutenant that was in charge and his, his handle or his name might be Foxtrot, Foxtrot 6. His radio operator would be Fox Trot Six X. I could have I could have used an easier name, couldn't I? But anyway, there was a there was a way to identify who was calling and who was the who's the radio guy. Okay, uh, one of the things that you mentioned in terms of uh, one of the impacts of 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 being in a potential battle zone is uh, adrenaline and what it does to you when you're 20 years old and so forth. What what are we talking about? Oh, that is a wonderful thing. Adrenaline, I mean, it's, it's not, it was not unique to us at all. It happens to anybody that is involved in a, even sports. You, people can relate to this. If you're in sports, the adrenaline rush keeps you queued up, but in a combat zone, what the adrenaline means is that every sensory organ that you have, from hearing, from sight, from smell, to your gut reaction, to your intuition, all of those are brought into play so that you can kind of have a feel or some x-ray that's out there uh, hopefully anticip anticipating uh, maybe troop movement or something that could be um, harmful to your health. Well, uh, clearly, of course, being focused is a skill that uh, is going to keep people alive, but that's often a selective process that determines who becomes point. Mm -hmm. uh, w w what's that about? What if, if, if you were point on patrol, what would that translate? What does that mean to somebody if you were point, I was, I walked point myself. Uh, others, when I was squad leader, I would assign to be point. And those individuals were the ones that I knew would pay attention to what's going on around them. There were some that were quite useless. And so if you sent some useless individual out there, then he could potentially get the other, the rest of the squad killed, if not himself. And so it made, uh, made good sense for us to, uh, rely on those that had, had that skill set, that skill level, that they would have our best interest in, in mind as well as their own. So the makeup of your platoon, your squad, is about actually a collection of different skills. And uh, where did these people come from? It was, it was interesting. So in my squad we had, or in the unit, you had people from all over the United States. It could have been uh, guys from uh, that lived in the Bronx, that lived in uh, 
high population areas that we're very very familiar with uh, urban environment as an example nothing but nothing but building they'd never stepped foot on a blade of grass or out in the woods there were others that came from maybe Tennessee as an example or very much the, um, the rural parts of the country and so they had had a skill set that would was very adapted to where we we're operating in the jungle and some occasions the uh, the guys that came from the urban environments that maybe had uh, had to use uh, their urban skills getting in and out of buildings might be something we would draw upon is how do we go into the Sioux area what do we need to be aware of because I'm from a, I'm from the uh, a rural area I was a hunter I didn't know how to operate in the urban environment so we had a way of identifying folks based on what they maybe had done prior to coming in the military that might be able to serve us and keep us alive. So those conversations back at the base become really important in terms of the characteristics that people bring uh, uh, into your uh, command, if you will. Yeah, very much so. And oftentimes it was done, uh, humor was a kind of a, we used the gallows humor a lot to, to get us through a tough days and things like that. And so just in talking with each other, you know, you might ask questions in a rather, oh, I can't use the terms right now, but it was a way to joke around with each other to find out what did you do. And we had pet names for everybody, but it was derogatory, of course, but it was all done with a sense of camaraderie. So it, it helped us deal with the stress of the situation, the stress of the day. But you're dependent upon each other. Yeah, very much so. So, uh, uh, also, uh, relationships change as you get towards your end of duty. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, literally uh, uh, terms used for people that were short timers. Mm -hmm. uh, a short stick man. Uh, what happened uh, in, in Vietnam, especially with, with those of the route in the out in the jungles, as you became close to the time, it could be maybe. I think six months was the time where people started to pay attention to how many more days they had left to go. And so six months was seems, from what I remember, would be a, a, uh, a mile marker. You made it for six months. You've acquired some skills. You might have been shot up. You've seen a lot of stuff. You've participated in a lot of stuff. But you're in your, your final six months. Then it became your final three months. So it became apparent that you've made it that far. What do I got to do to stay alive for the next three months? And so... What, what our men around us would do, if, um, as an example, if my squad was assigned point for that day, uh, I would say, okay, I'm going to walk point off of this hill because I'm the only one familiar with it. In a very fond term, they might say, um, no jerk, we're going to take point for you. And so what that meant was they realized that I had a short time left to go they wanted to make sure that I went home. And so the younger guys that were there would then take the, the hazardous duty of maybe walking point or doing some other things that they perceived it might put me in harm's way. So we tried to help each other out as much as possible as far as make sure that we went home. And you actually had an incident where you were rela replaced at point towards the end and still bad things happen. Uh, yeah, exactly. There was, um, this was in December of 1968, so I was about a little more than maybe two months before I was due to leave. Uh, I was tasked, my squad, with walking off this mountainside. I volunteered. I said, no, I'm going to walk point off. My guys wouldn't have anything to do with that. So another guy, I said, okay, Dobrats, you walk point. So as we broke out into the, up, out of this hill, uh, we went too quickly because the leeches were just coming off the branches and getting on us, and we were more concerned with that than the, uh, what we should have been. So we broke out into the open. He hit a, a um, booby trap, which is one of our grenades in a can, tripwire. Grenade came out, it exploded. He took the majority of the concussion, the blast, and it sent him home with what we call the million dollar wounds. So I spent about uh, a week or two weeks back in the rear recovering, but. That so you, was an example. So you took shrapnel and still stayed in the field? Yes. Okay. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> there were attempts to try and get you into uh, less strained uh, positions, and eventually you became eligible for R&R. &R. Uh, where'd you go and why? Oh, I think R&R &R for me was maybe eight months after I had been in country, and I elected to go to Hong Kong, which was 
Several things were uh, apparent. I was able to contact my family via phone. My grandfather said, I'll pay whatever the charge was for you to call me, which I did, which is about, about 90 bucks back in 1968. So that was a lot of money back then, but he wanted to hear from me in the worst way. And I was so glad that he, he said, okay, I'll pay for that. But it was a way to go from a very chaotic uh, environment, being in the jungle and in combat environment, to, um, to Hong Kong, which was hugely chaotic in its own right, and it was just such a, such a culture shock from where I had been back to that, to that area. So it um, wasn't very relaxing at all. Ate a lot of interesting food, bought a suit that I shouldn't have bought. It looked horrible, but it was popular. With Well, uh, but one of the problems that uh, we discovered looking through some photos with you is uh, uh, you weren't physically the same person uh, when you arrived and when you left. Oh, you would bring that up, wouldn't you? But anyway, it is, it is a transition. So um, I believe I mentioned to you that I was about 190, maybe 200 pounds, six feet tall when I went over to Vietnam. So immediately you're, you're thrust into this, this position. You've got a, a backpack that weighs close to 100 pounds. I always carried more than the other guys because it is yeah, ammunition, um, water, and food, and things like that. So... Uh, I dropped 50 pounds. I went from about 190, 200 down to about 150. So, uh, a pretty and, sight. All right, and uh, we have a picture that you showed me of, of uh, one of your colleagues in typical day gear out in the field. Mm -hmm. um, what are we looking at here? What's that? What's the image inside that picture? Well, given the time back in the 60s, they, the, the highest level of technology that they had for us, we had, of course, the steel helmets, which were, which were needed. We also have a, what was called a flak jacket, which was, I think, made up of layers and layers of fiberglass or some sort of material that would absorb uh, a bullet from an AK-47 or would, it would absorb the fragments from a, um, a grenade, things like that. So oftentimes we would wear those because of the weight. Oftentimes we would not wear those. We would take a, take a chance so, okay, but um, among other things that you're encountering, just uh, you know, if if, 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 if if you said repeatedly when you did see action, more often it was smaller and things like snipers. Mm -hmm. So it it uh, staying alive is uh, heavily dependent upon where you're located, uh, what you got around you, and what you can use. Uh, what. Uh, uh, I assume that uh, your point man is critical in that conversation about what safety looks like. Mm -hmm. Correct. How, how does that work? Well, the, the point man was, generally, was definitely the first one going into a hazardous area, and so he would be the first one that would draw fire. However, oftentimes what the enemy would do is they would let the point man pass as well as the second or third individual so that they would have the whole squad in the in the kill zone, so to speak, and so then all hell broke loose, and so we had a procedure on which we would handle uh, that situation if it came to that. Hopefully, we would see them before they would see us, and we would then uh, fire upon them, which which kind of sprung their uh, their attack before they had a chance to. So once again, that whole concept of the need to have the adrenaline and the awareness of where you're at comes into play. Correct. Uh, however, there is also that uh, psychological thing about uh, 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 you're being transformed while you're uh, in, in hostile territory, and there is that uh, uh, almost an addiction uh, that follows in terms of you've got every organ in play and you're engaged because you have to to stay alive, but it's hard to draw back from that. Uh, can you show me signs of that, like when you're uh, finally withdrawn from a uh, combat area and back at base? As long as we are uh, in country, as we called it, whether it's a fire support base or even on foot, you, you're able to relax a little bit if you were <clears throat> back at a large uh, base like Chulai or Da Nang. But you never, never went anywhere without your weapon. If they said you don't need to take your weapon with you, we would say uh, to hell with that. Of course, in different terms, but that was our that was our ability to to protect ourselves. And so we we're not going to go anywhere without that without that rifle next to us. So 
the transition while in, in Vietnam pretty much uh, didn't happen as much. Coming back to the United States, that was a whole different, a whole different scenario to where you, you had to realize that uh, you're not being shot at, uh, things are different now, but it is a s significant change um, to be able to uh, deal with that and uh, let go of it. Sometimes it took years to do, a lot of, a lot of vets still don't. Uh, a lot of us, um, still when you walk into a restaurant as an example, or a large room with a large number of folks, we need to find out where the ex exits are. There's one right there and, and things like that. So if something happened, we would have a way out. So it's still a protective instinct that can be uh, still among us, maybe more so for others than uh, and uh, also, the makeup of your squad brings with them different individuals, different characteristics. Uh, what are the guys that come from rural areas going to bring that might be a skill set that would uh, help you in terms of what you're doing? The guys that came from the rural areas oftentimes were hunters, and so they had um, a skill set which included tracking animals, of course, back in the civilian world, but they used that skill rather handily to... Uh, to help us track enemy um, enemy movement. I mean, you can a blade of grass. The grass has been a certain way. Different signs that are left uh, on the ground could indicate uh, the size uh, of a contingency that's operating in the area. Could indicate some other things. Often, if we injured somebody, if we shot them, blood trail would would tell us something as well. So, they were adept at reading reading those signs um, that would that we would use in uh, staying alive. All right, now you also have uh, lots of different weapons that uh, can be available to you, but you've got to get the right person with the right weapon. Is there any example that you can think of that uh, would help us understand that? Oh, uh, well, for the most part, uh, we didn't have any snipers assigned to us, and that would have been a different weapon system altogether, generally a, uh, um, a uh, Bolt action rifle that a sniper would use. We didn't have snipers assigned to us, so the majority of us carried what was called the M16. It could have been different versions of that. Officers carried a CAR 15, which is a smaller version. We had M79 grenade launchers, which were kind of a large tubed uh, device that, that fired a projectile similar to what it would be like throwing a football. So that was used to bring some, um, some hurt on the enemy. But I, I would assume, because that isn't a straight aim and, and pull the trigger, mm -hmm. that you have to have an individual that really knows how to use that. Otherwise, it can be even a hazard to you. Nope. We were pretty good as far as keeping ourselves alive. Last thing we wanted to do, have friendly fire come at us. So the, the grenade launcher was, it was a fun weapon to shoot because you could see it arc as it went over. And so there was, you're right, there's some folks that were better at that. If you had a football player on your team, a quarterback or something, here, this is yours. But that also meant a large amount of ammunition that was heavy. So oftentimes we didn't want to carry that. We give it to some other, some other poor sucker because he could yeah. use it better. But you got to have it with you. That's the... Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, eventually your tour of duty begins to wind down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you have to uh, uh, start that transition now back towards the homeland. Uh, how did you get notified? Where were you? And uh, what were the steps coming back? Well, there really was no, no notification other than the fact that we kept track of how many days we had left. So I think I went in country on, um, oh, I think it was February 21st or something. And so from February 21st of 1968, I knew that my magic magic time away from there would be February 21st of 1969. So as those days days approached, uh, that was my, my clock that kept me kept me on focus for that. All right, the day arrives. Uh, you 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 got to check in your gear. And you got to start the process coming back. Actually, the first step in that was that we would the company commander would know that SD and maybe some others, uh, their time was up. Got to get on that bird and go back. And so we would then be on a fire support base, again, taking on pretty supplies that those would remain after us. But the helicopter would be called in. Helicopter would arrive with new recruits that would replace me and others that were leaving. And so that was, uh, it's, uh, I can see it as plain as day right now. It was surreal 
because you all of a sudden your ear your year came to an end and you've experienced something that is so far removed from an everyday life experience and you're you're still alive you're still vertical and breathing and you're getting on that helicopter with all your gear going off to a fire support base where you turn in that stuff and then eventually uh, board a it was a commercial airliner that took us I think from July back to the United States so it was interesting you really didn't leave in country until you could feel as we all know when the wheels lift off of the tarmac then you were truly on your way out of course we still thought somebody went through an RPG at us and so you're still thinking about that stuff it's the what if what if what if but that was the uh, that was the point to realize that we were going home all right uh, 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 eventually you've got to sign out of the surface where do you land uh, where are you processed and what happens next so I landed at uh, McCord Air Force Base about 12 o'clock in the morning called my parents they came and got me had a period of time to ideally readjust from a year's worth of that stuff before reporting to the next duty station which was at the Presidio of Monterey which is the defensive language Institute. So the last six months of my tour were spent down there in charge of uh, post police. Basically, we, we did, I was in charge of a group of guys that, prisoners from Fort Ord, that we would bring over that would do the maintenance on the, uh, the officers' quarters at the DLI, the Language Institute. So did that for six months, and then at the end of, end of that period of time, was able to uh, discharge out. Uh, all right. Uh, so, um you come back to civilian life now, you, you decided to go back to school, is that correct? Correct. Uh, where and what were you studying? It was a huge transition, just trying to put things into perspective. Uh, television looked different, everything looked tremendously different. Of course, I hadn't realized that I had changed quite a bit during that period of time, so I was looking through uh, civilian life through different eyes at that point in time. So. Uh, I went back to work for a grocery chain called Albertsons at that point in time. They held the job which they had to do. So that gave me some financial st stability to then determine or figure out what I was going to do for the rest of my life, which included going back to uh, or enrolling in Bellevue Community College in their, I think they called it the police science or law enforcement degree program, which was two years. And so I went, went through that uh, and graduated in 1972 or 73. And then went looking for a job. Yes, I did. So I thought that some uh, police department might like to use my skills that were rather unique um, in this new line of work, which I thought would be rather uh, a, lot of, a lot of fun. So, however, there were many uh, other police officers that were moving from city to city looking for other opportunities. And so the, the um, uh, competition was rather fierce for those positions. And I think I applied for one department and that never that never panned out so I went back I stayed in working for Albertsons and then did some other other jobs after that what kind of jobs oh I knew I didn't want to make retail grocery my career so I uh, I was in the insurance industry for about five or seven years I realized I didn't want to do that I did construction for a while still relatively young and healthy and then uh, about 1983 or so I was serving on a volunteer advisory board and then was offered a position with a, a group called the Vietnam Veterans Leadership Program. It was a federally funded position uh, with many uh, similar groups all around the United States and they had a small amount of money and a short run like maybe three years to have an impact on how Vietnam veterans would transition back from military service to civilian world and they did that in different ways whether it was housing working with the business community, things like that. Too. All right, so let's go back to your own personal experience. Uh, you made a reference uh, in a prior conversation about uh, even you discovered that being a veteran seemed to bring restraints even in things like job interviews, casual contact, um, even making friends. When you went to college, what did, what did that translate? Those are difficult times, and oftentimes veterans like myself from Vietnam, we refer that to that as the legacy of Vietnam because we found it difficult. We couldn't tell folks that we served in the military, and God forbid if they found out that you served in combat because you're even more 
targeted because of the uh, um, uh, the opinion that was uh, in society at that point in time in the 60s. And so we found ourselves um, actually identifying other veterans. At college, I remember I met about seven or eight other guys. Funny thing, they all had prior military experience. So it was a safety net for us. We, they knew what I had, had done and I had an idea what they had done. But the, the, common, the common bond was prior military service. So it was comfortable for us to hang out with each other. So that takes us into one of the uh, impacts of, of being uh, a war veteran, which is you find by your experience that you now actually, instead of simply easily blending back in, become a little bit isolated from those around you. Mm -hmm. Now that clearly uh, impacted some of the choices that you made uh, 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 after you, you went through this uh, process of learning what you didn't want to do into what you did find much more satisfying. Can you talk a little bit about dealing with veterans housing? Well, the transition, it, I'm not sure how I exactly arrived at that, but it, seemed, it felt good at the time. In other words, I, had a, I knew what being in the military was like. I knew that there was an emerging uh, homeless uh, issue among Vietnam veterans, and so with my skill set at that time, with the desire to, to do something to help out and use my experience, it was kind of a natural blend along with some other, in some other areas as well, to have an impact in that manner. So it was kind of getting a, a kind of a toehold into this arena, helping veterans. Um, All right, you referred to the uh, Vietnam Veterans Leadership uh, 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 Program. Yes. Um, where is it located, who's in it, and what are you doing? That group still exists today, but it's an all-volunteer uh, advisory board. No paid staff are on that. They basically oversee two transitional housings that are two transitional housing projects, one at, uh, in Burien and another one up in uh, Seattle by the, uh, on Lake Washington, or near Lake Washington. So both of those facilities were put together with, uh, like, house that which we paid a dollar for from the VA it was a repo you were able to do that back then and so the houses were renovated put online and they're filled with chronically homeless uh, veterans at, which they still are so the boards are still operating in a different fashion uh, my job with them or my connection with them is to uh, to work with them and maybe developing an, another house as an example or looking at ways that we can use that existing support structure maybe in a different different way to meet the needs of younger veterans that are. All right, so l let's take an example of one of those acquired houses. Mm -hmm. So the veterans have, for whatever reason, ended up reclaiming a house. It's an older home, you have to transform it, and then you have to manage it. How right. does that happen? Uh, that in itself is a whole process. The, the federal government had uh, funding that was available for new and innovative projects. And back then, we knew that there was no there were no transitional housing facilities, at least in the Seattle area, and as far as we knew, nowhere else in the United States. So we set about developing this request for a proposal or responding, coming up with this idea that we then presented to the state, to the county, and also to the, to the federal government to consider funding this new idea, which was the creation of a transitional housing using what the VA had on the repo list partnering with the federal government, the state, and the county to come up with a funding package to renovate it once we acquired it. And then after that, we through the business model that we had put in place was how are you going to run and manage the facility. So funding had to be put in place, the partnerships agreements had to be established, and then a business plan on how you were going to staff these and what were you going to do for the veterans that were in these facilities and ultimately into the second facility as well. All right. Uh Typical housing project, uh, how many residents and uh, are they employed? That's the goal. So both of these houses have uh, the capability of handling, I think, six uh, veterans with their own private rooms, managers on site. They're connected with different different services. If, they're el if they can go back to work, they're connected with uh, maybe county services or federal services that have jobs that they could, could perform. If they need to go back to school for retraining, that is an avenue that we go down as well. If they cannot return to work because of, uh, as an example, um, maybe injury sustained while on active duty or maybe post-traumatic stress, 
then apply to the VA for a claim for compensation, which would then compensate them for what they sustained on active duty and give them a living, um, living amount of money for the rest of their life. Do these populations tend to be stable once they're housed? We have a lot of examples to where, yes, once, well, if they're housed, what was interesting is we, we would, uh, they had the right to stay there for two years. But once you give somebody the support that they need, whether it's employment, a stable place to live, don't have to worry about eating any longer, it's amazing how, um, how resilient the, the spirit is where an individual can then start doing what they need to do to become independent. And oftentimes we found that they were moving out much sooner than the two years that, they, uh, that we thought they would stay. So they actually are being integrated back into society then? Yeah, very much so. Okay. Uh, if I can, I'm going to jump back to uh, uh, Vietnam for uh, one picture that sticks in my mind. You're at an observation post and you're looking over uh, concertina wire uh, to, to secure the immediate area. Yes. But you're looking at a very peaceful setting and it's got morning fog rolling in, almost mm -hmm. looks like a, a river uh, flowing up. It, it, do those moments of sudden clarity just come back? Yes, I can remember uh, numerous times. I mean, you found little ways, little respites during that, that horrific year to where you'd just be actually in the moment where you would be sitting. You might have the last guard duty, and so you're there when the sun comes up. Beautiful, that's a given. If you're looking out from this fire support base, which is an elevated, it's like a mountaintop, you're going to see the, the cloud formations just moving through the valley, valley as, they, as they would, convection or whatever. And then you'd see kind of the blooming of, of the countryside. And so you're able to experience the peace and the tranquility amongst the chaotic world at that moment in time. So it was, it was a point to where you could actually enjoy the moment, maybe recharge for a little bit, and maybe in some of the internal conversations that uh, one would have with oneself, says, hmm. I'm going to come back when I'm ret not, not so much retired, but after military service. And you know, a resort down there on that river might be kind of nice. I could probably make a buck. You know, but that was the self-talk. That was the, the way to uh, kind of disengage for the moment. Uh, so one of the lessons modern society has only gradually become more aware of is, the, unfortunately, the disproportionate number of homeless who are Vietnam vets. Um, uh, do you think we as a society are, are coping with that or is that just do you only deal with it when you have to type of problem? The homeless issue has is, is really uh, become apparent over the, you know, probably since Vietnam. I might, but dealing with homeless populations and the immense uh, challenge it puts on cities, um, Governments, as far as how we're going to take care of these folks, the shelters where they're going to live, we all know the stories about homeless folks being on the streets, which has an impact on businesses, tourism, things like that. And so, homelessness has been very much a culture from a funding standpoint and from an awareness standpoint, which includes just not Vietnam vets, but homelessness in general. But specifically, since Vietnam, uh, providers uh, have had to become aware of what's unique about Vietnam vets, what do we need to know about them to be able to to help them to the degree that they need. And so the awareness, the veterans culture, as we call it, has been become an institution to where providers that were not in the military could benefit from the uh, the training or the education that we could give them on the population that they're seeing, which in a lot for a lot of cases would include a number of Vietnam vets, as an example, or even new vets coming out. Because with veterans, there are different things that um, folks could, should, or could benefit by knowing about, because it's kind of a, a puzzle to be able to put that together in a cohesive fashion that would enable them to do as much as they possibly could for, for the clients that they're seeing. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, Joel. Uh, this is uh, Tim Clark and uh, conversations about the Vietnam War. And my guest has been Joel Este. And thank you so much. Thanks, Tim. Okay.